Martin Scorsese's latest film, Killers of the Flower Moon, is a retelling of some of the events that took place during the Osage's Reign of Terror. The Reign of Terror took place from around 1920 to 1927. During this time period, a number of the Osage tribe members would experience mysterious deaths. The events took place in Fairfax, Oklahoma, which is in Osage County. The Osage tribe would land in what would later be known as Osage County after being forced to sell their land in Kansas and other nearby territories. They chose this land because it was rocky and fertile and they were hoping that it wouldn't have any value to the white man so they wouldn't have to migrate again. They paid about 70 cents per acre for the land. They were able to get their settlement set up and it looked like they had a peaceful place to call home. The Osage were able to enjoy their land as their own up until the 1880s when Oklahoma began its process for statehood. During this process, Native American reservations would be taken and they would be forced to live on smaller plots of land. Each Native American was given an allotment of land that could only be passed on through inheritance. Also during this time, the Oklahoma land rush would occur. In 1889, 50,000 non-Native Americans would descend on Oklahoma in a mad dash to claim the unsettled lands. Not long after the land rush, oil was discovered in the Oklahoma Territory in the late 1890s. In the early 1900s, oil was discovered in the Osage Territory. This discovery of oil would turn the Osage Nation into the richest people on earth per capita. Unlike the other tribes of Oklahoma, the Osage had purchased their land. So when resettlement came, the Osage were the only tribe that were able to work out a deed with the government because they owned their land. The Osage made a genius move with their deed. In the deed, they included a clause that would allow them to keep 100% control of any minerals that would be found below ground. Oil would be included in these minerals, and when it was discovered, it would attract oil tycoons from all around the country. Oil barons such as Frank Phillips and Harry Sinclair would get their stake of Osage land by winning various auctions. The leases for the Osage land was auctioned off for as much as $2,000 per parcel. That would equal about $73,000 in today's money. The entire Osage tribe became multimillionaires off of the leases. They owned mansions, had maids and butlers, and during a time when not many people owned a car, a lot of them owned multiple cars. The Osage Nation thrived throughout the 1900s, 1910s, and into the 1920s until a curveball was thrown at them in 1921. The federal government made it mandatory that any members of the Osage tribe had to prove that they had competency in order to handle their money. If they couldn't prove their financial competency, they would be assigned a financial guardian, which nine times out of 10 would be a white man. With these changes, white men of all creed began flocking onto the Osage nation in hopes of either becoming an overseer or marrying an Osage woman. After being assigned overseers, many of the Osage would notice that they were starting to lose money. Then Osage members started dying mysterious deaths. One of the most affected members was Molly Kyle. She lost numerous family members during the reign of terror and would go on to break the case wide open. Molly would lose both of her sisters, Anna and Rita, to murder, and her mother would pass under suspicious circumstances. People think that she was poisoned. Molly would go on to marry Ernest Burkhart, who was portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio in the movie. Ernest Burkhardt, along with his brother Byron, would arrive in Oklahoma in 1912, where they would live with their uncle, William Hale. William Hale, also known as King Hale, made his fortune as a cattle rancher. He had a controlling interest in the Fairfax Bank, along with a number of other businesses. He also served as a reserve deputy sheriff in Fairfax, 
and he had his hands all over the local politics, making him the most powerful man in Osage County, the self-proclaimed king of the Osage. Ernest Burkhart would work for his uncle and also drive a taxi to earn money. While driving his taxi, that's where he would meet Molly Kyle. The two began dating, and in 1917, they got married. Around this time, mysterious deaths start happening to members of the Osage tribe. Molly Kyle, now Molly Burkhart, had started losing a number of family members to mysterious deaths, including her sister Anna. In May of 1921, Anna was found in a ravine with a gunshot wound to the back of her head. A few weeks after Anna's death, Molly's cousin Charles Whitehorn was mysteriously shot and killed also. Shortly after Anna's passing, Molly's mother Lizzie became seriously ill. Many believed that she was slowly being poisoned, and two months after Anna's death, Molly's mother Lizzie passed. Anna and Molly's mother Lizzie would inherit Anna's money. For her to suddenly get sick and pass in a short time, it made perfect sense for people to think that she was poisoned. Molly's sister, Minnie Kyle, was married to W.E. Smith. In 1922, she died under suspicious circumstances. On January 15, 1923, Molly's cousin, Henry Rowan, was found shot to death inside of his car. Molly's last remaining sister, Rita would go on to wed W.E. Smith. Yes, that's the same W.E. Smith that was married to Minnie. They moved to the countryside thinking that it would be a safer move. But after losing so many family members, Rita decided she wanted to move back to Fairfax to be close to family. On March 10th, 1923, a bomb blast would go off under Rita's house, killing her, her husband, and their housekeeper, Nettie Brookshire. After her family members' deaths, Molly would inherit their head rights, which would give her the rights to all of their money and properties. With her inheritance from the head rights, it made Molly worth over $12 million, which would be over $400 million in today's money. In 1923, George Bighart was rushed to the hospital after drinking poison whiskey. He was rushed to the hospital by William Hill and Ernest Burkhart. While at the hospital, Big Heart requested his lawyer, William Vaughn. He explained to his lawyer that he believed that Burkhart and Hale were behind a lot of the mysterious deaths. Vaughn would be found dead the following day on a railroad right-of-way outside of Pahuska, Oklahoma. The Osage were dying at an alarming rate and were doing everything that they could to get attention from Washington to come help solve these murders. An oil man who was friendly to the Osage traveled to Washington, D.C. to petition on their behalf, but he was found stabbed over 15 times inside of his boarding house. In 1925, the Osage finally got the help that they had been asking for when the Bureau of Investigators assigned field agent Tom White to their case. Tom came from a law enforcement family. His father, brothers, and many other families were involved in law enforcement in many different levels. He joined the Bureau of Investigators in 1917 out of Texas. The Bureau had been investigating the Osage murders for over two years, but could not get any further because of corruption. Tom would bring in a loyal group of investigators that would help him gather information and bring the case to a conclusion. The Bureau began gaining ground when they started focusing on Molly and her family. Molly had suspected that her husband was poisoning her. She was thinking that she was being poisoned through her liquor. She confided in her minister that she believed her husband was poisoning her through liquor and he advised her not to drink any more liquor and notified the investigators. The Bureau got its big break when outlaw Blackie Thompson was arrested for murdering a police officer. Almost immediately after his arrest, Blackie implicated himself and Ernest Burkhart in the murder of Rita, 
her husband, and their maid. After hearing that Blackie had implicated him in the Smith murders, Ernest Burkhart turned state witness and testified against his uncle, William Hale. Burkhart would state that John Ramsey and Bill Hale were behind the Osage murders. Hale and Ramsey were able to avoid prosecution because they were able to keep the trial on a state level where Hale would have all the power and control. The luck for Hale and Ramsey would finally run out when it came to the case of Henry Rowan. The first trial resulted in a hung jury and several witnesses were later convicted for taking bribes or giving threatened testimony. The second trial would take place in Oklahoma City, and this time Ernest Burkhart would testify, and he stated that his uncle, Bill Hale, paid Ramsey $500 and a new Ford to kill Henry Rowan. In his testimony, Hale contested that he wasn't in Oklahoma at the time of the Rowan murder. He stated that he was in Fort Worth, Texas at a livestock show, and he had no reason to want Rowan dead although he did have a $25,000 life insurance policy on him that he would later collect on. The jury found them all guilty and they were sentenced to life in prison. Unfortunately, life continued to be unfair for the Osage, as Burkhardt was paroled in 1937, but he would go back to jail for robbing his former sister-in-law's house. He was later convicted for the burglary and would once again be paroled in 1957 and then he was pardoned in 1966 for the Osage murders. He lived out the rest of his life in Cleveland, Oklahoma until his death in 1986. William Hill was paroled in 1947 and moved to Phoenix, Arizona until he passed in 1962. He was quoted as saying, if that damn Ernest had kept his mouth shut, we'd all be rich today. Unfortunately, these monsters didn't get the justice that they deserve. Depending on the source, they're responsible for between 60 and 200 people losing their lives. Due to their heartlessness and deadly lust for money, many Osage families were destroyed. Many of their descendants still reside in Osage County, and they're helping to keep the memories of their ancestors alive. I thank you for tuning in and I also thank you for your valuable time. I'm throwing two fingers in the air until the next time we meet.